Hi, everybody. Welcome to On the Money. I'm Maria Bartiromo. The markets go on a tear, setting January records. What's next and where does the economy go from here? We've got two of the smartest guys in the room with some answers. Then my one-on-one -on -one interview with Bill Gates. We'll talk charity, innovation, and the technology revolution. What's most exciting to you? Then the big musical series that's helping to reinvent what you see on television. I'll talk to the men behind the hit series and get the scoop on Smash. You want to go write your own musical? Great, go ahead. On the Money begins right now. This is America's number one financial news program, On the Money. Now, Maria Bartiromo. Here's a look at what's making news as we head into a new week on the money. Slow but steady, that's the picture when it comes to America's economy and job creation. The Labor Department says 157,000 new jobs were added in the month of January. About in line with analyst expectations, the unemployment rate, though, ticked up to 7.9%. But the job creation numbers for the previous two months were actually revised upwards. The Dow Industrials wrapped up the month of January on a down note on Thursday, though it had the best January performance since 1994. The Dow closed above 14,000 on Friday for the first time since 2007. For the month, the Dow Industrials were up 6%, the S&P 500 5%, and the Nasdaq was up 4%. I think there's a lot of positive in the market right now. Is it going to go straight up? No. Is it going to blow up? I don't think so. Is February and March going to be choppy because of sequestration? Yes, but I think that we're higher from here by the end of the year. Meanwhile, U.S. economic growth was non-existent in the last quarter of 2012. In fact, the gross domestic product contracted by an unexpected one-tenth of a percent. Defense spending and business inventories were down, but consumer spending was up, an encouraging sign. Some big Internet companies reporting earnings this week. Facebook beat expectations, as did Yahoo, though its guidance was disappointing. Amazon fell short. And among large industrials, Ford beat expectations but showed weakness in Europe. Boeing passed estimates and said its top priority this year is to fix the battery problem on the 787 Dreamliner. In spite of good corporate earnings, though, some big investors are worried about what Washington may do. I think the hardest thing in investing today is the intersection of politics and business don't work, right? It's very hard for business people to figure out what politicians are going to do. And... Um, and they do things for non-economic reasons. Meanwhile, BlackBerry is hoping its new phone and operating system will be the Perfect 10, the company unveiling its new product line, the BlackBerry 10. The new phone comes with 70,000 apps and it's designed so you only need to carry one phone for both personal and corporate use. There's a music store, there's a movie store, so that indicates that the audience is regular people. And yet, there's this BlackBerry balance feature that lets a company put their apps and wallpaper in a segregated sandbox. And you can't see that stuff without the password. So in other words, you can have your personal stuff and your corporate stuff side by side. Just part of the conversation taking place this week in the news. It has been an extraordinary week with the markets having an astounding month and enough economic data to choke a horse. We have two of the smartest guys in the room right now to explain what it all means. Roger Altman is with me. He's former Deputy Treasury Secretary under Bill Clinton and Chairman of Evercore Partners. Also with me is Alan Blinder. He's Professor of Economics at Princeton University and former Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve. He is also the author of After the Music Stopped, The Financial Crisis, The Response and The Work Ahead. Gentlemen, it's good to have you on the program. Great to be here. Thanks so much much for joining us. So much to discuss. So, Alan, this week we got the employment report for the month of January. Yep. We That was in line with expectations. The unemployment rate ticking up to 7.9 percent. And then we got that disappointing GDP report. What does this tell you about where we are in the recovery? Well, it, I think if you what you need to do is average through the third quarter, which was higher than it should have been, and the fourth quarter, which is lower than it should have been. Why do I say that? You had this big, mysterious bounce up in defense spending, government spending in general, but including defense, that seemed mysterious in the third quarter. Then it disappears in the fourth quarter. If you average those two, ditto with inventories, at inventory accumulation, then decumulation. If you average those two, it looks like it's been looking like a sort of a 2% minus growth trajectory, which is, you know, far from zero, but not very good. What do you think, Roger? Oh, I agree with Alan. I think uh, we are growing at around 2%, uh, and the fourth quarter will turn out to have been an outlier with a minus 0.1. Uh, I, I personally think that as the year goes on, 2013, and we get towards the end, we're be going to begin to pass out of this four- to five-year period where the dominant force 
was the headwinds triggered by 2008, uh, and we're going to move into a somewhat better period of growth. And I think the, once we turn the corner that way, the risks may be on the upside. Okay. Well, meanwhile, throughout all of this and this uncertainty, the markets have been on a tear. Uh, so much money moving into equities, and you're seeing even the small investor uh, begin to return to the market. So does this jive in your mind in, in terms of what's behind all this vibrancy? For this well, stuff? I think it does jive because of this point on uh, transitioning to a stronger economy, number one. But number two, CEOs are, are optimistic now. And the degree of optimism I thought was surprising, and I think you're seeing that in, indirectly in the way the equity market's performing. Is part of that the fact that the Federal Reserve has created this environment where there just are not a lot of alternatives? Uh, people looking for yield, looking for return, where are you going to get it? Yeah, I think that's right. And look, that was the one of the stated objectives of the Federal Reserve. You can find that in 27 Bernanke speeches that we want, you know, he says it in a slightly more veiled language, but we want to beat the rate on treasuries down to nothing so that people have to go out and buy something else other than treasuries. And that's what they've done, real One estate and stocks. Let's talk about the debt, because this is obviously front and center as well. Uh, I want to get your uh, take on, on what we hear from Maya McGinnis from the uh, Fix the Debt Committee. I'm worried that they're talking in ways that entrench on both sides instead of thinking about how do we focus on what needs to get done and we haven't done yet. Reforming entitlements and the tax code and putting in place a deal that's big enough bigger than the sequester, to actually put the debt on a downward path. Now, Roger, I know you say we're already on that path toward getting our arms around this, but it just seems that we all know the main drivers of the debt, $16.4 trillion in debt this country faces, its health care costs, its Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, and there aren't any real plans on the table to, to slow down spending. Well, I think it's a mixed picture, Maria, as follows. Uh, Yes, I think more deficit reduction is occurring than most people realize. Uh, if the sequester actually occurs or cuts equivalent to the size of the sequester occur, 1.2 trillion over 10 years, uh, you, you will have had 3 trillion of deficit reduction done or in, in the pipeline. Uh, and Simpson Bowles two years ago called for four and a half. So you will have done two thirds of what they then said, although if they were sitting here today, they'd probably call for a higher number. However, uh, it's not being done the right way. It's not being done on the one hand in a balanced way, in a adequately balanced between revenues and spending, and the key to spending uh, re restraint over the very long term, entitlement reform is not, as Maya McGinnis said, part of the picture. And, and Alan, your book, let's talk about that for a moment, after the music stopped. Yeah. You argue that the TARP and the stimulus uh, did their jobs. Yeah. Why and what did we learn from the crisis? Well, why? We had a very sick financial system, especially a sick banking system. That had to be the first order of priority, even though it was bound to be incredibly unpopular politically, which it was, and still is, by the way. If you ask people about the TARP now, they sort of twist their heads into awful shapes and say, why did the government ever do anything like that? There was reason. Because if that ship went down, the financial ship went down, all of us were going to go down with it. It will go down in history eventually as an incredibly successful government policy, as will the unknown piece of it, which is the bank stress tests that followed the following spring, that sort of put the green light back on the financial system. The government said, we've examined these. Some of them have to raise capital. They raised the capital. It looks safe. You've got 10 financial commandments going forward. Yeah. I especially like, thou shalt remember that people forget. This is my personal <laughs> favorite. And thou shalt keep it simple, stupid. Right. Do you think we will? No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're still remembering because the wound was deep and it's still healing, but as things get better, people will get carried away in euphoria again. And you can be sure that Wall Streeters will start inventing concoctions that barely anybody understands. Including uh, them? Including them. I mean, we saw this in the crisis. Right. Some of them really got caught in their own mousetraps. Absolutely. Gentlemen, great conversation. We so appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alan Blinder, Roger Altman joining us. Up next, we're on the money. And with the billionaire determined to give it all away, Microsoft founder Bill Gates on his mission to change the world and what he thinks of the company he started in today's technology industry. That's coming up. And later, the business of Broadway, how the big bets are the real showstoppers on the great white way and beyond. Stay with us.
Well, the world's second richest man, Bill Gates, has a mission to change the world, one dollar at a time. The billionaire philanthropist released his annual letter this week describing the work his foundation is doing to address challenges in global health and education across the globe. I spoke to the man who made Microsoft at the World Economic Forum in Davos last week on the road ahead for the company he founded and his successor, Steve Ballmer. Tech leaders, those are hard jobs. Uh, and Steve's done some amazing things. Uh, it'd be great, you know, when he gets more market shares. A lot of Microsoft has not had an easy time recently. Would you ever return to the CEO office? Well, I'm engaged uh, as chairman on a part time basis, but my full time work for the rest of my life will be the foundation work. Uh, you know, Microsoft's got a lot of exciting things going on. It's a competitive field. You know, Windows 8's done well, Surface Computer's doing well. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I share lots of ideas about where office should go and, uh, you know, I think the field as a whole uh, should be proud of how quickly it's moving and, you know, Microsoft will lead in a lot of those, those areas. You and Melinda have given away some $28 billion through your foundation. Your fortune is still more than $60 billion. How do you see your work now? Well, we're committed to the diseases that affect the poorest, uh, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, all the, the childhood conditions. And until the, we treat the health of that poor child as being as important as the health of uh, a rich child, we'll still have work to do. And, you know, so that gives us uh, you know, decade after decade of needing to make progress. Uh, malaria is a great story. The deaths have come down a lot. We don't yet have the tools to do an eradication, so we are funding drug companies, vaccine companies, even new bed net concepts that'll, when, they, when we get them, will eventually give us enough to take whole countries and get malaria to zero. And you know, someday that, that'll become a disease uh, like smallpox, like polio will be soon that won't, won't be uh, killing anyone. What continued investment is needed at this point? In other words, who are the biggest stakeholders that you want to reach, that you haven't reached yet, that haven't been as generous as they could? Uh, is this process harder as we see austerity taking place all around the world? Well, the money that helps out the poorest overwhelmingly comes from government aid budgets. And so uh, what kind of priority that gets, say, in the U.S. budget process over the next four or five years, I'd say it's pretty unclear. Will the generosity go up? Uh, will it be cut proportionately or will it suffer a disproportionate cut? Uh, you know, unless we tell the aid story very well, you know, I, I'd be quite worried about less generosity. Let me ask you a little about technology. A massive revolution continues. Social media, what's your take on what's going on right now and what's most exciting to you? Well, we're taking the, the internet revolution and we're applying it in more areas. Uh, so for example, in education, the idea that the, not only are the best lectures online, but you can interact with people, talk to other students, uh, that we ought to be able to deliver education that's higher quality, but dramatically lower cost. A lot of our unemployment is because uh, kids aren't well educated enough. If you're a college graduate, you know, unemployment is very low, and so we've got to increase access to education, but letting the price go up uh, won't won't allow that. What are you hoping for in terms of the developments at Microsoft? Are there areas that you'd like to see the company uh, further into? Well, we've got Windows and Asset, and Windows and Office as two primary assets. And in Office, letting people prepare information and share it in the interactive way, now there's a ton we can do. Uh, Skype is the most popular communication service in the world, but we can make it easier to find people you want to talk to, organize groups, get notified. So we're in so many areas where we're thinking about information workers in a deeper fashion than any of the other companies. You know, we, we're, we've got our, our great software skills. Uh, so I'd say the opportunity is as, as great as ever. Uh, we've always loved the amazing competition in the field, and uh, it, you know, it's as exciting as it's ever been. Tell me about your own technology use. Final question here. It was reported that your daughters aren't allowed to use Apple products. Uh, what do you carry? What's always in your hand? Well, I use Windows PCs to do my reading. Uh, Windows Phone is a fantastic product. Are they not allowed to use Apple products? Well, they've never shown any interest. I mean, they love their Windows Phone, so... Uh, so there you go. <laughs> Bill Gates, thanks very much for joining us.
Up next, we're on the money and inside Broadway's billion dollar industry with two veterans who've taken their show on the road all the way to Hollywood. The producers who know how to succeed on Broadway, on television, and at the upcoming Academy Awards. Oh, aren't you proud to be in that fraternity? The great big brotherhood of men. You gotta find a way to stay with the show. Any suggestions? Come on, kids, let's put on a show. My next guests are some of the most successful musical producers across theater and film. Best known for producing Best Picture winner Chicago, as well as stage to screen musicals Hairspray and The Music Man, they're also producing the 2013 Academy Awards program. Craig Zidane and Neil Moran is joining us right now. Good to see you guys. Thanks very much for joining us. Our pleasure. Good. Yeah, we're good. glad to be here. Yeah, yes, it's good to good. see very you. Glad. I Look, I'm a big fan of Smash. I want to say that right uh, out of the gate here. You produce Thank Smash, you. which starts its second season on television this week. Uh, it's interesting that musicals have become so popular on television right now. I, I th actually think that Glee opened the door for that to happen. The, the enormous success of Glee made the audience used to seeing people sing and dance in scripted form. And Smash took it a step further by having original music and also by having the backdrop of a Broadway musical. And so that it's very organic and it gives us license to play with the form. Craig, Smash is about the Broadway industry. Is there a chance that developing this show will launch a new business for you, an actual stage production of the show within the show? You know, when we first started working on the show, Steven Spielberg, who hired us and asked us to produce the show with him, because it was Steven's idea originally, uh, said, one day in success, if we get to that place, maybe one day we'll take the show that we're writing for Smash and mount it on Broadway. So it was never a game plan, but we always thought in the back of our minds that could be like a fantasy. And, and you know, uh, you know, when we are uh, shooting, we all stand around on the set watching these incredible musical numbers happen, and we say, wouldn't this be great on stage? So we've certainly talked about it, but the actual reality, it hasn't happened just yet. Oh, you're right, though. But I mean, if, what, if, yeah, what, what, it poised, it's poised for such success. I agree with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in success with, with doing that, it creates a new business for us. I mean, the idea of basically platforming an original show on TV and then having it adapted to the Broadway stage and then tours and then make, maybe make, making an, a feature film of that. I mean, it really, in success, it's limitless. Look, you know, I've been working on this documentary on Broadway, and throughout the yeah. prep, we, we've been we've been hearing that uh, Broadway is particularly an industry where you can you can make a killing, but not make a living. <laughs> that that is the greatest quote because it's so true. Because maybe less than thirty percent of the shows that are produced on Broadway actually recoup, and that's not a very very high percentage rate. We're very lucky. We produced two Broadway shows in the last couple of years, uh, Promises, Promises, with Sean Hayes and Kristen Chenoweth, and How to Succeed in Business with Daniel Radcliffe, and both shows made their money back. So uh, we, we've had uh, a great batting average so far, which makes it easier to raise money for all of our future shows. Let, let me ask you about your, your current project, and it's a huge one again. You're producing the Oscars. Uh, later this month, hosted by Seth MacFarlane this year. Neil, how tough a job yep. is this to get, number one? <laughs> you've got it. Uh, oh, and Craig, man. who are the stakeholders to please? I mean, you've got the network, you've got the advertisers, you've got the audience. So talk to us about the Oscars and putting this show together. Well, you know, it really wasn't tough to get the job because we weren't anticipating it at all. We were we had talked about it for years and years and years and we've said it's been on our bucket list of things to do, but there's not a campaign that you do. One day we were involved, uh, Smash was shooting, Craig was working on some other project and we got a call from Hawk Koch at, he's the president of the Motion Picture Academy and he said, would you guys like to do the Oscars? But it's really exciting because it's like the biggest candy store you can imagine because you're dealing with literally every star in Hollywood and every creative person in Hollywood. And for the most part, everybody wants to be on the Academy Awards. 
And, and you've got Barbara Streisand performing, right? Is, is live music going to be incorporated in the show throughout? Yeah. Very much so. We have Adele, who's going to sing Skyfall, the first time she's ever sung the song live, and maybe the only time she sings it live. And Streisand hasn't done the Academy Awards in, you know, 36 years. All right, we will leave it there. Guys, great to have you on the program. Best of luck with the Oscars. Great. We'll be watching. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank Hope you. you like it. Uh, I'm sure we will. It's good to see you both. Craig <laughs> right. Zaden you, and Maria. Neil Maron joining us. Up next, a look at the news this week that will have an impact on the money. As we take a break, take a look at how the stock market ended the week. For more on our show and our guests, check out the website, otm.cnbc.com. And I hope you'll follow me on Twitter and on Google+. Look for at Maria Bartiromo. Now, look, the stories coming up in the week ahead that may move the markets and impact your money this week. Earnings reports are out from Disney, BP, and technology companies Yelp and LinkedIn, among others. Monday, the president will submit his budget for 2013 to Congress. And on Thursday, the fall fashion week kicks off in New York City. On Friday, we'll find out if the U.S. is importing or exporting more goods with the balance of trade released. That'll do it for us for today. My guest next week, Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman will be here. Each week, keep it right here where we are on the money. Have a great week, everybody. I'll see you again next weekend.